pastor's not letting me be late. That's right. And neither does your boss. All right, let's go into God's word this morning. After Easter, man, I feel like I feel like I wanted to just encourage you. I promise you I'm not going to step on anybody's toes this morning. So we're going to talk about money. Matthew, kidding. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is talking about money here. But uh, but we're going to we're going to take it um, in a direction um, and show what we value and we're going to talk about worship. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, if you have your Bibles or your notes, you should have received your participation guides when you came in. Uh, it's important to take notes because you'll probably need them later this week. Uh, it says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy um, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor or nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. It's interesting to me that your heart follows your treasure. Uh, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is actually darkness, or is darkness, how great is the darkness? Uh, what Jesus is saying is here, is, here is, is many of many of us, we walk around thinking we have the light. We have purpose. We have meaning. But if it's not Jesus, that light we think we have is actually darkness. Uh, and it says here, no one can serve two masters for he will either hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And I'd love to title this message for all my note takers, Can We Split It? Can we split it? Uh, let's pray, and then we'll take our seats and jump in. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray that no matter where somebody finds themselves on the journey of faith, God, I pray that this morning you speak to them. God, for those who are fervently following you, encourage them. God, giving seed to the sower. But, Father, for those who are hungry, for those who are coming looking for answers, God, I pray you would give bread to the hungry. And, God, no matter where somebody finds themselves, God, we all know this, that we all have a step to take closer to you. In Jesus' name we, uh, we pray. Come on, Victory City. Everybody said amen. Grab your seats. Let's jump in. Come on, I know that uh, many of you can identify this. If you're a parent, if you're a husband, if you're a boyfriend, um, this idea of splitting a meal. Um, I don't know how many, how many men in the house you love to split a meal. Uh, I don't love to split a meal. My wife sometimes, just let's just split something. No, I'll just buy my own, and I'll buy yours, and then whatever you have left over, you can take it home, and I'll eat it at like 10 o'clock at night. Uh, but I don't want to split it with you, you know. Um, I, I love it when you go on a date, and you're like, I'm not really that hungry, and you're like, okay, cool, well, then I'll just order, but the minute the food hits their nostrils, they suddenly want some of your food. Come on, come on, uh, all the boyfriends and men in the house, can I get an amen? You're like, yeah, my, my wife does that. Uh, but I feel like uh, men, we're just as bad because sometimes when we pick up Chick-fil-A on the way home, how many of you guys know that all the French fries in the bag, no matter what receptacle they're in, are free game? Right? Like when you pick up Chick-fil-A and you order four Chick-fil-A meals, all the French fries, that when you look down in the bag, they're all yours. And so that when you get home, if somebody's French fry bag is a little light, you just have to say, listen, I, I don't know what happened. Uh, I guess we split it. Right? And come on, dads, how many of you love, you love the extra bonus of all the French fries that fall out into the bag, and you're like, those are all mine. That's the dad tax. That's dad territory. It's all mine. Come on, fellas. Can I get an amen? You're like, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's going to be mine. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I ain't no splitting no stuff. I, I really don't like to split it because it's like, well, listen, I paid for it, so I want all of it, uh, and I will pay for you. I don't want to have to split it. Come on, how many parents, you've got kids, and maybe you've just fed them, but you're now going to make you something to eat or drink, and your kids walk up to you and you're like, can I have a bite? I'm like, no, I, this is mine. I made this for me. I just fed you. Like, why do I got to give you more things. I feel like kids are, are more bored than they are hungry sometimes. Come on, you got parents in the house. You're like, you just ate an hour ago. You're not hungry. You're just bored. Like, go play outside. Come on. Any parents just lock their kids outside sometimes? You're like, the door is locked. Use your imagination. Figure it out. And you always do this. You always say it like this. That's what my parents made me do when I was a kid. So you know what? I'm going to make you do it too. Come on. How many parents you love to give your kid the filtered water of the water hose? Anybody? Anybody love to give the Dasani of the backyard? Yeah. 
You're like, oh, he does that? What a bad parent. No, I only give my kids Evian. Um, no, I think, I think here's the deal. Like, like if God paid for all of your heart, why do so many of us, we split it between other desires in our world? Jesus is looking at your heart and he's going, I paid for all of it, so why are you splitting it? Like, why don't I get all of it? Why do the cares and concerns of this world, why do you split it up in between all those other things? If I paid for all of your heart, I want the whole thing. I'm tired of you splitting it. And how many of us, we often find ourselves with our hearts being split between two masters. Jesus going, hey, you're either going to love one and despise the other. You're going to be devoted to one uh, or move away from that. You can only serve two. And so many of us, we, we serve other masters. For many of us, if the shoe fits, we serve money. We serve material possessions. Uh, we serve our appearance and our reputation. For some of us, we put our family above our faith. For others, we put our love life above our faith. We put our identity and what we feel like we want to be in the world above our faith. We put our hobbies above our faith. We find ourselves split between different devotions and different desires. Can I tell you this morning that worship really is ultimately what you want? We worship what we want. Now, you would think that worship is just a decision, but can I tell you that worship is actually a desire? Come on, can I get a testimony for all the people who would believe and are thankful that Christian music uh, is not as bad as it used to be in the 90s? Christian music has come a long way. There was a dark period where, like, my parents used to be like, you're going to listen to Christian music, but it's so bad. Like, I don't like it. Like, it's terrible. I prefer Nelly. Um, but, but I think a lot of us, we think that worship is a decision that we're making. Come on, I grew up in a church where you had a hymn book and you had the chorus book. Come on, you ever have that? You may grow up in a church like that. I grew up in a church where, where you had a transparency up front, right, where she was slip, uh, flipping slides, you know, and if the church mother ever got the lyrics wrong, the whole church just stopped worshiping, right? Because she couldn't figure out which slide to go to, so you just started singing, hey, Jesus, and heart, and you just didn't know where to go. But I think we reduce worship down to a decision we're making in the moment. But can I tell you, you worship what you desire. You worship what your heart desires. Now some of you would say, no, 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 no. But I can promise you, every single person in this room worships something. The question is, is it the right thing? Are you, are you splitting it between different devotions and different desires just like Jesus is talking about? He's saying, man, some of you are chasing the wrong master. So I've got three easy questions for you to kind of determine for yourself maybe what you're worshiping that's not God. You can write them down in your notes in your participation guide. The first one is this, is, is what do you always have time for? Like, like, even when my schedule is crazy, even when my life is hectic, I always have time for this. Like, I always have time for a cowboy game. I always have time for me time. I always have time for my Netflix, Netflix show. I always have time for social media. I always have time. So, so when your schedule is crazy, what do you always seem to have time for? Like, babe, I just got to go in the garage. I got to have some meat. My, my, my week's been crazy. I can't, I can't fool with it right now. Like, I got to have some time for me. Could it be that the thing that you always have time for is the thing that you're actually worshiping? Meaning, worship comes from the root word of worth. You're saying, this is worthy of my time no matter how crazy my schedule is. Second question is this. Is what do you always seem to have money for? Come on, no matter how broke you feel like you are, you're always going to have money for this. Come on, I know some men that no matter how broke they are, they always have money for their F-150. Like, I'm always going to have money for my truck. Come on, how do you guys know I'm always going to have money for my Netflix? I'm always going to have money for my hobby. I'm always going to have money. I was sitting, uh, getting my oil change a few weeks ago, and I was sitting in the, the, the little lounge there, and me and this older guy was talking, and we were just kind of griping, and he had a big truck, and I was like, man, it must be painful for you right now with gas prices, and, and the oil changes have gone up. I feel like everything's gone up, and um, so we were talking about that, and he goes, man, listen, I don't care how much things cost as long as I got enough money for my beer. 
And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, that's my beer money. My wife doesn't bother it. She knows I'm spending money on the beer, and that's what I'm going. I was like, that's a great sermon illustration right there, right? Like, like I don't care if my, my world is falling apart as long as I got $50 from a Coors Light. Um, but what do you always seem to have money for? I always have money for my hobbies. I always have money for my me time. I always have money, you know, for the things that I want. My whole life could be tearing apart, falling apart, but I always seem to have money for this. Could that be the thing that you're worshiping? What do you, third question is this, what do you seem to always worry about? What, what always provides you with a level of anxiety? So, so like, uh, 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 you know, am I, am I going to be accepted at work? Or, hey, is everything going to be okay with my kids? Or, hey, am, am, am I going to be invited with that friend group? Or, am I going to have enough when I retire? I think many of us, we, we are consumed and we worry about the things that we oftentimes could be splitting our heart. Could be, be worshiping the very thing that we're always worrying about. You see, these three simple, not, not, not conclusive, but, but simple filters can help you determine going, man, is my heart split? You see, worship is less about the decision you make and a style and a preference, and it's more about what you want. What do you want? What, what does your heart desire? And I wonder, church, uh, excuse me, let me go to John chapter 4, verse 23. I jumped ahead. It says this, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. You see, God isn't looking for super Christians. God isn't looking for perfection. God isn't looking for you to memorize the Old Testament and the New Testament, although that's not a bad thing. God isn't looking for you to be the strongest person ever, to never fail and to never make mistakes. What God is looking for in his believers is people who will worship him. Will they be devoted to them? Will, 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 will we be a church who says that Jesus is the strongest desire in my heart? Jesus is the one that I claim is worthy. So I wonder, church, as we've been in a series of polarization, I wonder if we could be a church that will be polarized towards worship. Polarized towards worship. You see, I think for me, you know, Worship is such an important thing in my life because I always wasn't a worshiper. I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. And, you know, we went to a church about 40 people. And my dad was actually the worship pastor and the preacher. How many of you guys are thankful I don't do that because uh, I am terrible? Uh, thank you for Isaac and the team. But I remember I used to just sit in church. Yeah. Yeah. Isaac, did you just yell yourself, or was that Alex? <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, yeah. Totally sounded like Isaac. How many of you thank for Isaac? Isaac was going, yeah, amen. <laughs> but, uh, but I remember I would sit in church, and, you know, one of the things was I, I wanted, I, you know, I, I thought I was too cool for school. And, uh, you know, I just passed the time during worship. Um, I'd tune out worship, and my dad was really grieved, and he would come up to me and have conversations, and he would say, son, do you not, why don't you worship the Lord? And I would say, oh, dad, I do, I do, I do on the inside, like I really love God on the inside. You know, I, I don't like to sing, I don't like to raise my hand, I don't like to do all the, that physically expressive stuff. And he goes, it's interesting, because like when we watch the Cowboys, you're really physically expressive. <laughs> come on, and let me just talk to the men really quick. How many of us, we don't set the physical example for our family? Because we use this excuse of going, well, I'm an internal processor. I'm an internally expressive person. So for all the wives out there, whenever the husband wants to get a little frisky, just go, baby, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were an internal guy, not an external guy. <laughs> Remember, you can't, you can't raise your hands in worship, so don't be putting your hands on me. Uh, I got a headache. You can internally make love to me. You know what I'm saying, right? Like... Like, isn't it funny how as men, men, we like to pick and choose what we want to physically express? You see, when Jesus says in spirit and truth, meaning this, spirit is on the inside, truth is what we verbalize, how we express. So can I tell you, men, when you lift your hands, you're showing your family, this is the true, our act of worship. This is the truth, and I'm showing you by physically demonstrating it. But sometimes, men, we can be a little too macho. 
We can feel uncomfortable, but that's why Jesus says it's a sacrifice of praise. If it was easy, can I tell you that it wouldn't be a sacrifice? Because sometimes we worship when we don't feel like it, don't we? When our week hasn't been good, when our week hasn't been perfect, when, when sometimes we're walking through storms, and that's what Jesus says, I'm looking for people. And I can remember growing up, I never wanted to worship until Jesus really got a hold of my life. And suddenly I began to own my faith. Come on, some of you, you went to church with your grandma and you didn't own it until you were 37. But once you began to own it, you caught it and you were like, oh, now I see what she was praying for me all those years. And I remember being in church service once I suddenly discovered how powerful worship is. Man, I was the guy that had the hands up. I was singing loud. I wasn't even on key, but I was singing loud. No longer! See what I'm saying, right? Like, I was singing to the point where you ever, you ever been in church service and, and the person in front of you, you're singing so loud, they do like the, the look back to be like, can you be quiet, please? You know what I'm saying? Like, I was worshiping, and they're like, they kept looking at, why are you looking at me? But I just decided I'm going to shut my eyes. I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to sing to the top of my lungs because he's worthy. And guess what? You, sister, sweetheart, who's turning around at me, you didn't save me. You didn't heal me. You didn't rescue me. You didn't do jack squat for me. But he did. So I'm going to sing loud. I'm going to lift my hands. And if I make a fool of myself, I'm doing it for the king I serve. Come on. And I just believe in the live music capital of America. Why would we not have the rowdiest, the loudest, the most rambunctious, the most worshipful, the craziest? Come on, I'm going to lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so that when people come into this church, they go, whoa! Like, why should Zilker Park have anything on Pflugerville, Texas? Don't go to Stubbs. Go to Victory City Church. John Mayer was in town. Y'all didn't go to that concert? Y'all, y'all, anybody go to John Mayer? You went? Christian and Abby Mool, for, former missionaries to Mexico, worship leaders at John Mayer. I'm preaching to them this morning. I'm kidding. Actually, I would love to have gone. Come on, but, but can the church set the pace in worship? You see, your polarization towards worship is problematic for the enemy. But it's the point to your heavenly father. You see, the enemy doesn't want you to be polarized towards worship. The enemy actually wants you to play the middle. You see, the enemy doesn't keep you from worshiping. The enemy just tries to get you to worship 17 things get you to play the middle. You see, the greatest lie of the enemy is not the denial of worship, but actually the splitting of your worship. That's why Jesus leans into it. He doesn't teach this and go, hey guys, you've stopped worshiping me, start worshiping me again. He goes, hey, y'all are trying to serve too many masters. You're splitting your worship, you're splitting your value, you're splitting your desires. And I think this, when, when, your, when your desire is divided, guess what begins to happen? Come, come on, dis- disciples, you become distracted. And when your desire is divided, suddenly your discipleship gets distracted, and then your worship becomes diluted. Suddenly you're not giving Jesus everything you've got. You're giving him the leftovers from your week. You're giving him what strength remains. And guess what happens after you divided your desire, you've become distracted in your discipleship, your worship becomes diluted. Guess what ends up happening? It begins to destroy your relationship. And for many of you, you walk through seasons, I know I did, where it wasn't like my my faith was a light switch, where it was like on and then it was off. It was almost like a dimmer. It just slowly began to fade until it was off. And it all starts with where our desires go. Jesus says, in, or excuse me, David wrote in Psalms 37 verse 4, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of, his heart, of your heart. Where's my delight at? 
And here's the deal. Here's, listen, I know worship is more than a Sunday. I get that. Worship is every day. But I want to help you make one step, not 17. And can I tell you, if you can't worship in the house of God, you're not going to be able to worship in your week, like on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, when it's actually hard. Like, like if I don't learn to worship in God's house, it's going to be really difficult for me to live a life, life of worship out in the world. And so here's, I, I, really, I want to help you. I want to, I want to see you become worshipers. And the first step is just learning to worship in God's house. By, by lifting your hands, by lifting your voice, by pointing your heart and saying, God, God, teach me to delight in you. Teach me to find joy in you. Teach me to, to focus, my, focus my desires on you. So I've I, I got three questions I want you to ask yourself, uh, and I'm going to give them to you right now. One, two, three, really quick. And these are my points, and I'm going to be done. Three questions that's really important to know if I'm worshiping the right thing or not. The first one is this, will it last? Will it last? The second one is this, where's my focus? And the third one, really easy question is, who's my master? So this is just expository preaching. Write down Matthew chapter 6. Jesus talks about it. Will it last? What's my focus? Where's my focus? And who's my master? Let's jump in to will it last. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. You see, what you treasure is the thing you're willing to sacrifice for. Okay? The thing that you consider a treasure is the thing that you're willing to sacrifice for. So for many of us, we sacrificed sleep to earn our bachelor's or master's or our doctorate. I mean, you, you remember being in school, and you would study, study really hard. You would sacrifice sleep. It's not a bad thing because that degree was a treasure to you. you I, I want to get my degree. It's not a bad thing. But you sacrificed sleep. Why? Because you valued it. Well, let's think about this. How many of you guys, you will sacrifice the money in your savings account to be able to go on the vacation that you haven't been able to go on for three years. You're like, man, I have not left the country since 2019, so I don't care what it costs, I'm going to Mexico. Anybody living that life right now? No? How many of you guys would say, Let's, I, I might not even have it in my savings account, but I got a visa. And you know what? I'm going to put it on the credit card, and I'll pay it back because I need a vacation. Can anybody, come on, in the middle of 2020, were you like, I need to get out of here. I need a vacation. I need, like, some all-inclusive buffet, beach time, like, I am tired of staring at these four walls in my apartment. But you'll sacrifice your finances for what you value most. That's why no matter what it is, I'm going to still pay for the Botox. I'm going to still pay for the F-150. Like I'm still going to pay for the golf even though I'm terrible, right? What we sacrifice our finances for shows us what we value. I will sacrifice my worth for his or her attention and affection. You know that he or she is not to the same standard that you know God would want as for a partner in your life, but, but you will sacrifice your self-worth for affection from him or her. It shows us what we value. I will sacrifice my time with my family so that I can get ahead at work. And we use excuses like this, I'm doing it for my family so that eventually I can spend more time with them. We tell ourselves, I'm working hard right now to, to obtain financial freedom so that I can retire early. But how many of you guys know that seasons suddenly turn into years, which turn into decades, and suddenly your kids are out of the house, and you were chasing this dream for them, but you actually didn't get to spend any time with them. You see, what you sacrifice for shows you what you value. Now, there's nothing wrong in sacrificing for good and honorable things. Many of us will make sacrifices. We sacrifice sleep for our children. We sacrifice money for the things we need and want. We sacrifice time. But Christ asks this, will I be the number one thing in your life that you will sacrifice for? How many of you guys know this? That when our career asks us to sacrifice, it's almost an immediate yes. When Christ asks us to sacrifice, it's almost an immediate no. God, did I, did I, 
I don't know that that sacrifice is theologically correct. I need to test it and verify it. But Hebrews chapter 13 says this, Through Him, Jesus, let us continually offer up sacrifices of praise. So my thing is this, right? I want to ask you this. The thing in your life right now that you keep sacrificing for, you've all got it. Everybody does it. Will it last? Will it last? Will it go with you into eternity? All the effort, all the energy, all the time. Sure, it's good. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm asking you, will it last? Natalie told me the story of um, when she was a child, uh, her home got broken into, and they were coming home, and it was just Natalie, uh, Natalie's mom and her brother. Her dad was out preaching somewhere and out of town, and um, they pull up to the house, and they realize that the, ha- the house has been burglarized. I think that's like a very vulnerable feeling. Like, have you ever been broken into, and like cars been broken, and someone just took something from your house or your apartment? It, it can feel very vulnerable. Like, oh my goodness, someone just walked into my thing and just took everything. Um, and the funny thing is they, they actually were walking into the house as the, the thieves were leaving. Uh, so it was really scary because they walk in and they heard the, the thieves and they ran out because it was just two kids and uh, Natalie's mom. And the funny thing was <laughs> they were so uh, scared they actually just drove right across the street. They didn't know where to go, so they just parked across the street. But then when they went and did an inventory of all the things that that had been taken, um, they noticed that the one thing they cared most about that was gone um, was actually their family home videos. You see, it was like, take all my stuff, take all my things, but I can't replace, I can't replace the home videos of my fifth birthday. I can't replace the home videos of that Christmas. Like, I can buy new clothes, I can buy new furniture, I can buy new jewelry, but there's just certain things I can't replace. Come on. And can I tell you, there's just certain things in your life you can't replace. You can't replace God opening up an opportunity to minister to somebody, but because you're not willing to sacrifice, you miss that moment. Can I tell you that, that you can't replace the opportunity to be able to serve people who come in here every single day and you love on them because that moment gets missed? Can I tell you, you can replace things. You can replace material possessions. You can even replace a career. career. But can I tell you, you cannot replace a calling from God on your life. And my question for you this morning is whatever you're chasing, will it last? Will it last? Am I worshiping the things that are temporary or am I worshiping the things that are eternal? eternal? So the second question is this, where's my focus? So not only am I, am I worshiping things that will fade and erode and rust and die and go away, but what am I focusing on every single day? As a way to, to know, is my heart split? Where's my focus? Come on, any couples or friends, uh, all the couples in the house, maybe you've walked through this. You ever had a, a spousal sparring match where you got into a heated argument with your, with your wife or your husband or significant other? Natalie and I never, we don't, we don't really get into those that often. Um, I think there's been like three we can remember last week. And... Um, You know, I'm kind of an emotional guy. I'm kind of fiery. And sometimes after a fight or an argument, how many couples you know this? Like, like okay, after you've sparred and it's tense and cold, how do we break the ice and go back to being loving again? Like, okay, after we've just said all of our peace, who goes first and says, hey, you're really beautiful? You know, like, how does that, how do you, how do you break the ice? Um, and who goes first? Who, who hands the olive branch? Because how many of you guys know that after a fight, your adrenaline's still running, the temper's still there, there's still all the things that you wish you would have said, and then there's still the things you s- said that you shouldn't have, and it's just all in the atmosphere. And uh, w- one of us in the relationship is a little doomsday sometimes. Like, uh, like they, you know, one fight and they think the whole marriage is falling apart. There's one of us in that that, that is that way. And... Um, you know, I can't get past it. Like, oh my gosh, we're going to get a divorce. We've got to tell the kids. I'm going to have to resign from the church. You know, like, they're just one of us in that relationship that's like that. And, uh, and one of the things that the other person who's really good does is, uh, is we'll say, hey, let's just, let's, just look, let's just look at all the good. Let's just focus on the good right now. 
like, hey, I love you and you love me and we're committed to one another and, and that's not even an option for us. And, and, and what happens is we'll just start focusing on the right things and it's like suddenly all the pain and, and real challenges and tension, they kind of like recede a little bit. Like we still got to deal with them, but it's just not controlling my life. And here, Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, can I tell you, your whole body will be full of darkness. So, so worship actually helps you focus. Worship actually helps you focus on, on the right things and the good things. Like, think about it for you. Like, if you're a fitness person, you focus on how many times you've worked out. And you panic if you're a fitness person. Man, I haven't worked out enough this week. Because that's what you're focusing on. Come on, how many of you, 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 focus, you focus on social media a little bit too much? I learned a new term. It's called doom scrolling. Where you just scroll through all the doom and gloom of life, but for whatever reason, you're attracted to it. You're like, oh, Russia's going to take over the world. Gas is going to be $15 an hour. Uh, Biden's still going to be president. Or from you, Trump is going to be president again. Whichever one, you pick your pill, right? Like, you just doom scroll, and you're like, oh, my gosh. Because that's what you're focusing on, and now you think America is going to blow up and it's going to be terrible. Or you, you, you got to check your investments, right? I want to I check what the stock market is doing because that's where your focus is. You're, you're focusing on those things, and depending on whether the market's up or down, depends on whether you're in a good mood. Or some of you, you check your text messages because he or she left you unread. Right? And you're like, hey, you're still there. You're still up. And, and, and literally all you can think about all day long is he or she hasn't texted me back. Because that's our focus. Come on, some of, you, some of us, we, we check every sports game of every sport of every team. And it's like, you're terrible at all of them, but you're just addicted to the ESPN app. You're like, I don't know, what's the score of the Bruins and the Canadians? You're like, you're from Alabama. What do you know about ice hockey? That's not Mike. I just said that because he's on the front row. Um, you see, what you focus on oftentimes affects your heart. And, and I think for many cynics, they would be like, why, why does God have such an inferiority complex? Like, why does God need millions of people every single week just to tell him how great he is? Like, come on, God. Get some confidence. But can I tell you that God does not need your praise? You need it. Because God does not have an inferiority complex. Humanity has a superiority complex. We think we're smarter than we are. We think we're better than we are. We think we can handle things more. We think that we can split our heart into all these different desires and we'll be okay. And what Jesus is actually saying is I'm looking for people who will worship me and will focus their heart. So, so where is your focus? Where's your focus? You see, worship does not remind God about himself. Worship reminds me about God. Where's my focus? Third one I'm going to close is this, is, is who's my master? Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for he will do hate one or love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Let's just take money and just replace it with whatever you value. But some of you, if the shoe fits, wear it. For some of you, it's money. And that's why it's so hard for you to be generous. You think the church wants your money. You create inventive skepticisms about why you shouldn't tithe and give. Time is your master. That's why you won't serve anywhere. That's why you won't give your time and commit to to serving in the church. When the church says, hey, can you give us every other weekend? You don't want to because time is precious to you and you want the flexibility of going out of town and you don't want to have to commit to anything. For some of you, it's a reputation. I don't want to be a peer like a total Jesus sold out guy at work and so I'm going to keep it quiet. And that's great, but that, that means that reputation is your master. You see, I like clarity. I don't know about you. I, I really prefer clarity. Just, I, I, I'm, I'm a clarity guy and sometimes that gets me in trouble because I give people clarity. Like, I'm not super compassionate when it comes to pastoral issues. Like, in the sense that, like, when someone comes to me and they're like, hey, I've got all these problems in my life, what, do I, what should I do? And they're really looking for me to pray and make it all go away. I'm the guy that's like, well, you've just been acting like an idiot. Like, if you're not an idiot, yeah, that probably wouldn't happen. Because I'm just a clarity guy, and that's why I like it back. In fact, I ask my whole team every week, hey, tell me what was terrible about my message. How can I make it better? 
I don't need you to tell me all the good things. Like, give, give me it clear. How can I make it better? Because that's just how I am. And I, I always think it's funny when salesmen come to my door and they want to, like, they tell me how much percent they're saving me. That's what they lead. Hey, I'm going to save you 20% today. Hey, I don't care how much you're saving me. Just tell me how much it's going to cost. How many of you guys do that? You're like, I don't care about that. What, how much? I feel like my cell phone bill is almost like they tell you one number and then all the fees come. You're like, where, where do these fees come from? Can you just tell me how much it's going to cost? Come on, how many of you guys like clarity? Like, I just want, I just want to know how much it's going to cost me. I, I feel like the enemy does the opposite. He doesn't want to give you clarity. The enemy wants to give you this low bar. Hey, it's going to be great. You, you can split your attention. You can chase all the things. But then the bill comes, and you thought you could have everything, but then when the bill comes, the cost of it actually is everything, and you've lost it. While Jesus, up front, he goes, hey, listen, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be clear, here's what it's going to cost you. There's no clearance item. There's no 30% off faith. It's this. Hey, Jesus is going, I'm going to be real clear up front. It's going to cost everything. Like, I'm going to need everything from you. That's why people think Jesus is harsh. Why? Well, like, when Jesus says, I'm the only way. Like, not, it's not all these different routes of spirituality. It's just me. I love it because it's, Jesus is really clear. Like, it's either me or nothing. And it's going to cost you everything. But I think I can lean into some clarity there because now I know. Like, if I'm really going to follow Jesus, it's really going to cost me all of it. But Jesus says this. Man, if you'll give up your life, you'll actually find your life. Come on, you know people that, all, that chased all the wrong things, and for three or four years they, they were on top of the world. But then the bottom fell out, and they had nothing. Come on, man, when that relationship was fun, that's six months, before you hit any really trouble, it was great, but then the bottom fell out. You see, I think, I think, I think that's the way the enemy wants to attack you, is he wants to divide and split up your heart. And here's how I want to show you. I want to give you a little illustration. Um, uh, Isaac and Tanner are going to help me. Isaac, can you get the worship bucket here? Here you go. And Tanner, Tanner's going to come out. These guys help us in worship. Can you give him a big hand? A little quick hand. A little quick hand. All right. All right. So Tanner, Tanner represents you and I. And Isaac, he represents God, of course, with those shoes. Uh, so here's how it works. He's got an orange ball, and this represents worship. All right, y'all play catch. See, worship can sometimes feel like this. Just toss him back. Yeah, sometimes you drop it. Come on, God. And uh, you're just worshiping back and forth. And sometimes worship can feel like maybe you're not practiced as well, so maybe it's a little like, okay, how do I do this? But it's just you and God. Now, here's what you think the enemy is actually doing is wanting to step in and go, no, no more worshiping, Tanner. No more worshiping you. But that's not actually what the enemy does. The enemy says this, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to distract them. So when they're trying to worship God, I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw their career at them. Come on, you've been in worship sometimes, and everybody's singing about Jesus, but all you can worry about is, man, are we going to spend money this afternoon? And like, I don't know if I'm going to have enough money. Come on, come on. Right, you're in there. You're in service. You're worshiping the Lord, and, and God's saying, I don't know if your marriage is going to last, and and, and here's what happens. The enemy starts distracting you, getting you to chase all these other things, doesn't it? And you're just trying to catch the worship, and your heart is split in all different ways. And, and here's what the enemy does. He just overwhelms you. And, and maybe for a little bit you can somehow keep everything focused on Jesus, but you keep living life. And guess what happens? See, it, it continues to distract you. Was that a headshot? I didn't even see it. Pew, pew, call of duty. Uh, see, if the enemy can just distract you, he'll destroy you. All he's got to do is distract you. All he's got to get you is focus on other things. And here's the deal. God's going, hey, come on, I'm here with you. But for so many of us, we are easily distracted because we're, we're, we're far apart from God. And here's the beauty of worship. Here's where worship gets really good. Is this? Is worship is actually designed to do this? Just help you take a step closer to Jesus. Just help you take a step closer to Jesus. Okay, stay here. Stay here. Okay, you're not where you were, but there's still some space to kind of get distracted. And here's what God says: Is come on, take another little step. Take another little step. Come on, get real close to me. Okay. Now look what happens. Look what happens. Look what happens. 
if I'm really close to Jesus and I'm just worshiping Jesus, come on, no matter what distractions happen in my life, no matter what pain happens in my life, no matter what fear happens in my life, no matter what worry happens in my life, no matter what death happens in my life, can I tell you, no matter what my career does, no matter what the ups and downs, I'm focused on Jesus because I'm close to him. Come on, Victory City. Are there worshipers in the house this morning that'll say, I'm getting close. I'm getting real close. And I'm, I'm pushing away the distractions. Jesus, I'm not splitting my heart anymore. I'm focused on you. Come on, let's lift our voices to him this morning. Come on. Come on, you, you, you know you can't eliminate distraction. But I want to be so close to the one I desire that distractions, they just bounce off me because I'm connected with the Father. I'm worshiping Him. Come on. I'm polarized for worship. I'm polarized for praise. So we're going we're gonna to practice what I just preached. Y'all get that? And we're going to worship. And here's the deal. I'm going to challenge all my unexpressive people maybe grew up in a church that didn't do this. I get it. I want to be gentle with you. I get it. Like, what other public place do you just raise your hands and begin to sing? You don't do it at Chili's. You don't even do it at sports games. I want you to offer a sacrifice. For it. So, so whatever position you're comfortable with, this is pro level. This is beginner. Just find yourself somewhere in between. And we're going to worship the Lord. Can we do that? But before, hey Amen. Come on. All right. 1151. I'm going to move here. But first I want to pray. For some of you, you can't worship yet because your heart hasn't been unlocked by the grace of God and the surrender to. So I'm going to pray. And if you're here this morning, you're far from God, I want to, I want to pray with you so that you can worship God. And then we're going to worship. Okay. So bow your heads with me. If you're here this morning and you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe it's been a whole long time and you found that your heart has been split between multiple desires and it actually destroyed the relationship you would had with God. This morning is the, the day that you come back to Jesus and you say yes to Jesus and surrender your heart to him. And if that's you on the count of three, just wherever you're at, nobody looking around between me, you and the Holy Spirit. If that's you, just slip your hand up. One, two, three three. If that's you saying yes to Jesus, yeah, I see your hands, 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 hands. Praise God. Hands in the back. Hands in the middle. Hands in the middle. Come on. Praise God. Come on. Hands on the right. Man, so many hands going up. So many hands going up. I see you. I see you. I see you. Praise God. I see you on the left side. You can put your hands back down. Victory City. Let's pray this together as a family. Just say, Jesus, today, I surrender my life to you. I name you Lord. I name you King. And I name you Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and help me follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate every single person. And let's worship the Lord.